Welcome to the RFID for You video RFID training program. This module, RF Physics, covers some of the physics concepts used in RFID. The first contact concept we're going to talk about is called the carrier wave. Now, the carrier wave is the actual RF radio link between the reader and the tag. And this is how it connects, how it sends data, how it powers the tag. Um, so anyway, so the carrier wave is a waveform modulated with an input signal for the purpose of conveying information. The carrier wave provides the link between the RFID reader and tag. The frequency which a UHF RFID system operates is 915 megahertz. And 915 megahertz means 950 15 million oscillations per second and that all antennas are tuned to resonate only at a narrow range of carrier frequencies that are centered on the designated RFID system frequency. The second concept we're going to talk about is that of power. Within RFID we have two units of measure that we use related to power. One is the watt and the other is the decibel. Now the watt is something that we're all familiar with. We can put a meter on it, we can measure it, we have a 100 watt light bulb, a 50 watt light bulb. The second is a bit, bit more complicated. If we have a system, for example, we have a cable and we put power in one end of the cable and we get power out of the other end of the cable, we're going to lose some power going through the cable because of friction. So therefore, we, we can't put a meter and test and validate what the power is. So came up, Alexander Graham Bell came up with the concept of a decibel. And the decibel is the logarithmic function of the power out divided by the power in. And for definition purposes, one watt equals 30 decibels. So once again, the decibel is the ratio between two quantities, the power out divided by the power in. It's a tenth of a bell. That's what the D stands for, DESA is a bell, and the bell is the unit of measure that was defined by Alexander Graham Bell, and hence that's why it's capitalized. Now a dB gain, decibel gain, has a positive value, while a loss has a negative value. And, and we do the calculations, but a simple way to work with decibels is that every time you double or have the power level, you add or subtract 3 dB. Conversely, if you add or subtract 3 dB, the power level is doubled or halved. And also, every time you increase or decrease the decibels by 10, you increase or decrease the power level by 10. So a 10 dB gain or loss equals a tenfold increase or decrease in the signal level. A 20 dB gain or loss equals a hundredfold increase decrease in the signal level. Therefore, a 20 dB cable loss would lose 99% of its signal. To make life easy, we created a couple of charts for you on the right-hand side. And as you can see, 30 decibels equal 1 watt. If you increase the decibels by 3 to 33, you double the wattage. If you increase the decibel by another 3 to 36, you again double the wattage. And if you subtract three decibels, you have the, the uh, power, the wattage. Okay, and so the formulas on the left are the formulas, and you can calculate them out if that's what you want to do. But basically, the idea here is looking at these is how we're ex how the information is expressed in the formulas. So in the second formula, you have the power dBi equals 10 log the, the power out divided by the, the power I, PI. And what the I here stands for is an isotropic antenna, meaning that they used an isotropic antenna to measure this. And we should have covered the iso what an isotropic antenna is in the previous video. Conversely, also, if you put in the, the, a D on the third form, uh, formula here, the decibel D, uh, the D is a dipole antenna. So it means that they used a dipole antenna to do the calculation and the testing. So if you see in the nomenclature an I, it means isotropic. If you see a D, it means dipole. So an example of this is that if a reader puts out one watt of power, which is the maximum that's allowed under FCC regulations, 
and that and one watt equals 30 decibels the antenna cable loses has a loss a DB loss of six decibels and the antenna boosts the signal by and by 12 decibels and so if we write the formula do we have 30 decibels minus 6 decibels plus 12 decibels equals 36 decibels. Now 36 decibels, if we break that down into 30 decibels plus 3 decibels plus 3 decibels, that means that 30 decibels is 1 watt. We increase by 3 decibels, that's times 2. We increase by 3 decibels, that's another 2. So in this case the system equals 4 watts. So if you saw a question on this, there would be two answers. One is the power out of the system is equal to 36 decibels or 4 watts, dependent upon the unit of measure. Next concept we're going to talk about is how low frequency and high frequency power the tag and affect, affect the communication. Now most of us in our schooling somewhere along the line had the situation where we had a nail and we wrapped a nail with wire and then we connected the wire to a battery and we made a magnet. Uh, and so this is the same concept here is that except that the antenna, the reader through the antenna, is generating a magnetic field. And if, if within that magnetic field we bring in a tag which has a circular antenna on it, we can create power and therefore the link to the reader. So LF and HF, and this is called inductive coupling, um, and if you notice down at the bottom that the power at the tag uh, equals 1 over the distance to the sixth. So consequently at 2 feet you have 1 32nd the power, and at 3 feet you have 1 729th the power. And what this translates to is short read ranges because the power drops off so quickly. If we're looking at UHF and microwave, they use a different concept for powering the tag and providing the communication link, and that's called passive backscatter. In this case, the reader sends out a signal to the tag. The antenna on the tag catches that RF energy, excites electrons, and generates a power flow which is what is used to power the chip, and at the same time it reflects back that wave back to the reader, and therefore completing a circuit so that the information can be sent from the reader to the tag and brought back to the reader. And that's called, once again, passive backscatter. And if, once again, in the distance, the propagation, the far field propagation, the power of the tag is 1 divided by the distance squared. So consequently, 2 feet equal 1 fourth power, 4 feet equal 1 sixteenth power, 10 feet equal 1 one hundredth power. So consequently, with UHF and microwave, we can get a much greater read range, much longer read range, than we can with HF and UHF. The information, the next concept is how do we send information on this wave? So to transmit the information to carrier, carrier wave, we have to make a change to the signal. The change to that carrier wave is called modulation. And what we do within the RF world to send data is that we modulate the amplitude. So as you can see in the chart below, if you have the amplitude that's, that's going along and then we drop the, the power, the amplitude, and it's down for a specific amount of time and then the power comes back up again, we increase the power, then based upon how long that power was down, we can have a zero or a one. If it's down for is a 6.25 micro, uh, then we can have the, the zero. If we have a sound for longer than that, it would be interpreted as a one. And this is called on-off keying. So once again, the concept here is you have the power in the carrier wave. If you drop the amplitude, keep that amplitude down for a specific amount of time, that's a zero. If you keep it down for a greater amount of time, that would be a one and that's called on-off keying. So in, in, along this lines, all data is transmitted in binary. It's either 0 or 1, and, and that's called a bit. 
bits are combined into bytes, which represent symbols. For example, in ASCII, the capital A is the binary 01000001. The modulated string is composed of a series of symbols, and each symbol may convey one or more bits. As we can see, the letter A uh, would require, in this case, seven bits to be able to uh, send the letter A. Okay. So in this example of modulation, we're, we're going from the reader to the tag. Uh, you can see in the top left-hand corner that you have the one how, from the dotted line to the dotted line is a given length. You can see that the zero is a much shorter length. So as we drop the amplitude for a given period of time and keep and bring it back up, the length of time will be able to tell whether it's a zero or a one. So this information is sent out to the tag, and this is and this particular case is called pulse interval encoding or PI. And you notice we're dropping the amplitude, and the middle diagram shows a more stylized version of what it looks like, and then at the bottom you can see the amplitude dropping and it's equal into five nanoseconds. Okay, and over on the right you have the tag that's receiving. You see it's receiving an analog signal, whereas the reader's putting out a digital single, uh, signal, and then it demodulates and translates the data. When you go back the other way, and now on the reflected wave and pass a backscatter, the tag is sending the data back, and the tag uses a, a method that's called FMO or Miller mode to identify the data to set up the zeros and ones and sends the data back to the reader and the reader gets it and as you can see on the top left it's up for a one, it's, and the zeros are down, the, the ones and you can see based upon the length of time that it's down and then you get a in the middle a stylized signal that shows what the zeros and ones are and you can see the short gap versus the long gap you know, the short gaps are zeros, the long gaps are one and that's how it uh, sends the tag sends the data back to the reader. Now there are two limitations to UHF far field read range. The one is the energy to power the tag. The tag with the chip on it uh, requires a certain amount of energy to power it on, to turn it on. And once again the in the backscatter UHF world, the energy is collected on the antenna and that energy then powers the, the tag, assuming there's enough power captured by the antenna to power the chip on the tag. So as the energy goes out, it fades. Uh, if you think of throwing a pebble into a pond, and you look at the concentric circles going out, as the rings go out, they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and that's the amplitude gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And at some point, you can't see them anymore. The same thing is true when you send out a signal that's going to the tag at some distance, the tag, there's not enough power uh, because of fade to power that tag. The second concept is the reader's ability to detect the tag transmission. And if you look back in here at this, if you look at this signal on the, the diagram in the middle of the page on the left-hand side, the receive signal, you'll notice that in the middle there's this large black box blob and on top and the bottom you can see a, a little bit of what the zeros and ones are. If the signal coming back is not strong enough to, to provide energy that will get it beyond the a black box in the middle there, then the, then the reader can't discern the signal coming back. And that center part there is called the noise level. Uh, so if the noise level is greater than the strength of the signal coming back, the reader can't read that signal. So once again, the two limitations to be able to read is the energy to power the tag, if there's enough energy out there to power the tag, and also the reader's ability to detect the tag transmission coming back to the reader. When we're in, the next concept is that of interference, and when we're working with 
RFID and radio waves, there are a number of things that can generate radio waves that are at or near the same frequency or half wavelength of frequency that we're using in our in UHF, that's 915. So if any devices kick out 915, they can interfere with the transmission and therefore cancel it or in, in some cases enhance it. So some of the common types of, of interference that we get, uh, we've put on this chart and we've identified it as predictable and unpredictable along the x-axis and we've put controllable and uncontrollable along on the y-axis. And so if we looked at some of the things, is that the wireless barcode readers uh, can uh, interfere, some of the wireless uh, handheld uh, telephones uh, can create 915 energy, which would interfere with the transmissions coming off of the uh, reader off the antenna. Uh, uh, we have wireless LANs. You know, for not too long ago, all the wireless LANs were 915 megahertz. They've since gone to 2.4 or 2.85 uh, uh, gigahertz. But uh, anyway, so if we have that, we can test for that. We can verify that. It's predictable. We can test it, and we can control it. We can say you can't use these devices in or around the RFID uh, sites or where we're using RFID. On the right hand side you have unpredictable, ground faults, forklifts, bug zappers, that's a f interesting one. Walmart when they were doing their initial testing and they were down in Houston in their uh, warehouses where they had a lot of bugs, so uh, hanging outside the warehouse doors they had the electronic bug zappers where the bug if it flies in and hits the coil, if it literally fries it. But for whatever reason, certain bugs of certain size kicked out RF at 915. And if it kicked out RF 915 and at the same time we're trying to read a tag, it would, could and would interfere with the uh, RF signal coming off the RFID readers. So consequently, they had to, to change the, uh, get rid of the bug zappers and went to a different methods of insect control and bug control. So those are unpredictable, but they are controllable. <clears throat> then we get into the uncontrollable, but it's predictable. And these we can test. We know that certain power lines are going to put out 915 RF, or we also know that certain cell phone towers are going to put out uh, RF, and we can test and we can design our system around it. Uh, the controllable and unpredictable is the area where we really have to think about and look about and be aware of when we're designing a system. In this case, mobile wireless apps, um, adjacent building RF, keep in mind the RF signal that we're generating out of these readers, even at, at one watt out of the uh, reader and, for, and four watts out of the antenna, can go 50, 60, 70 feet through walls and consequently uh, we could have a problem interference from somebody who's in the building next door. Um, also lightning can create problems uh, and static discharge can create problems for us. So all of this, there are many, many more uh, fluorescent lights, for example, when you walk into a fluorescent light, when the fluorescent light goes bad and the ballast goes bad, in many cases it kicks out 915 or 915 uh, RF. So consequently, there are many, many different these, and the, the idea here is that you need to identify what's, if you have interference, what's causing the interference, and if it's predictable and controllable, you, need, you do have to do what you have to do. If it's unpredictable and uncontrollable, then you have to decide what the impact is going to be on your application or the use of RF in that area. So what we cover is the definition of a decibel and a watt in RF power. We talked about passive tag communication. We talked about EM wave propagation. We have near and far field coupling, modulation and data encoding, and indoor propagation. That's the end of this segment. Thank you.